Hello my brothers and sisters of Dior, welcome back to Dior, I'm Celtic Templar, and welcome back to another reaction video on Thane Thran's videos. Now, today we're all, we're going to check out his latest video on the Egyptian Bronze Age duck bill axe, and these are very rarely talked about for some reason, because most people, when they think of Egyptian weapons, they automatically think of the Egyptian Kopesh, which is kind of weird, so, uh, yeah, why don't we get right into it, and we'll see where we get from there, shall we? here and I'm here with the Egyptian Bronze Age. We have a very special series of videos coming out here thanks to Neil Burridge from Bronze Age Swords. He has sent us an Egyptian collection and this is from the later or uh, middle late Bronze Age. We've got the Egyptian spear and I believe this one the design was used to pierce on the <laughs> test that in this series. I remember I I actually remember this or I, I, I think it was a couple years back that he did that video with the bronze style tip and it can penetrate uh, <laughs> the hood of a steel hood of a car so yeah uh, so don't underestimate bronze people just because it's a bronze age warrior doesn't mean he's easily able to be killed which is what we're doing today and it'll be the first time that I've ever tested a bronze axe and I think that I've seen anybody else do one. Let me know if you know anybody else out there who's actually tested against human analogs, armor, and so on. That's what Okay, uh, he asks this. Uh, I think there's only like one other person I do know about and or maybe two. Uh, and one of them is, uh, if I remember correctly, it might have been uh, Skullgrim. I don't know if it might have been Skullgrim. I don't know. I think it might have been Skullgrim. Although, I have seen other variations of axes that were tested. However, they weren't of this style of axe. They were mostly of this style of model of axe, which this one is the later model compared to the Duckbill model. I think this one was nicknamed the Falcon or uh, the Eagle Beak. I can't remember what it was nicknamed, but it was named after a bird. That's all I know. But I'm also told it might have been known as the Horus Axe, but I don't know if that's true or not. But due to its design, I'm thinking this was more of a wealthier design that would have been used by noblemen rather than the regular foot soldiers, which foot soldiers of the Egyptian military would have actually used the duck bill design. Many people don't realize this, but that's because the way you actually tell of a person's wealth is actually in his weapon. The more uh, decoration look it has, the more it's going to be used for uh, a nobleman. So, yeah. That's what we're going to be doing in this series. We will come back with it against this armor. This armor is not completed yet, but we're going to do a chariot-style armor made out of rawhide. That's right. Okay, uh, yes, this is actually true. Uh, this is actually what the Egyptians did. They made their armor, especially like this, uh, what each of you is showing, and I actually like the fact that he's actually showing multiple versions, and as well there is also uh, Mike Lodes, who of which I remember him having a show uh, like t being on dozens of History Channel shows back when it was History Channel was History, and it's this one right here with the uh, right over here and being the one with. Uh, the multiple colorations like we see with Thang Thran's video uh, image like he has and compared to the other one which is red blue and green so yeah and this is the best and they actually showed this going up against archery so uh, Thran you might want to take notes with this one because they tested it out with archery weapons spears and all that and it actually did pretty well and the fact is this would have been made out of rawhide, and I'll hear people, I mean, people already saying, Oh, Templar, isn't rawhide a weak armor? No, it's not. Rawhide is actually very strong and very durable, especially if you boil it. In fact, boiling rawhide, there is an account that stated that in many accounts, especially from the Bible, for example, that stated that the rawhide of the armor, the armor they were wearing, was boiled. And... This actually makes it dense and strong, but still light and effective. And the fact is, it, not just the Egyptians, but as well every Bronze Age culture, uh, probably before the Bronze Age collapse, used rawhide armor. In fact, the Assyrians, the uh, 
Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Hittites. There are various type of fonts. In fact, there are even accounts from the T Odyssey of Troy, for example, that states on Bronze Age warriors wearing rawhide equipment. Because, one, it was lighter, it was more effective, and mostly it was used by charioteers, but it depended pretty much on their wealth and status. And this would mostly be seen on horses, but there are many accounts that are actually being seen used on humans to especially stop the blows of archery. So, yeah. It's going to be actual rawhide, up to four layers, that will have to go through, plus the cloth armor uh, that will be behind it. And we'll see how that whole... Okay, this image here that uh, Therian is showing us, this is actually an actual depiction on Egyptian warriors. Now, Egyptian warriors would dress like this, but there was also accounts from later periods that they would wear a uh, variation of what they called stomachoganata, or I can't know, if, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing that in any way, but apparently it was a type of armor that would have been made out of entirely cloth, so padded armor. Yes, padded armor, and, and such... Sometimes it would be the only thing they wore instead of wearing a leather cuirass like they, like this image shows. It would have been just a pure cloth-like leather or a cloth-like uh, padding that would go pretty much up to here and go downward across the body. In other words, it would wrap around the body, but mostly protect the chest and stomach. Most of the time, that's though the stomach. So, uh... Yeah, it's kind of an understandable, but I think I might have actually had an old kidney belt that Th that Thran could probably use for this. Because I'm not going to be using it for anything. Thran, if you want it, let me know. Uh, but uh, I do have to say, but I would like to see him also try and test <laughs> out the weapons against a uh, Egyptian-style shield. Most people don't know uh, how dense these were, so it, it might have been... Because there are accounts that stated that they were... A mixture of papyrus and leather. So we don't know much evidence to prove it. So yeah, this could mean anything well what we can understand. So yeah. Pulls up against the axe, the spear, the duckbill axe, and we even have a kopesh. This is a kopesh, like a replica of Tutankhamun's tomb. Everybody knows him as King Tut. And uh, we did test a Canaanite version of this very much like this is a Canaanite designed axe. And it performed exceptionally well. Uh, there's sickle sword, they call it, or some people misnomer it that. I think it's more of an axe sword, in my opinion. It was you. Uh, yeah, it does have that right. It, it technically is an axe, but uh, it's in the form of a sword. Now, many people don't know anything about these style of weapons. There are various designs out there. The Egyptian kopesh is one of them. Another weapon like this could be also with the Greek kopes. Which, uh, many people mistaken for a falcata, they are not the same. And falcatas are slightly longer and more curved downward. And I actually have one myself, so yeah. And these were, because the kopesh was Egyptian, the kopes was, uh, Greek. And many people accidentally get the names mixed up, sadly. And then there is also the falcata, which is from Iberia, which is, some historians state it might have been from the Celt Iberians, other state from the native Iberians. We don't have much evidence to prove either other way, but yeah. Uh, but the weaponry used at the time did vary from user to user, so this was actually a devastating weapon on the battlefield. These are famed for beheading people ritualistically by pharaohs, uh, chopping arms and legs off in battle, cutting heads in twain. <laughs> and with the very light armor they wore early Bronze Age and in the early Egyptian wars, they wore just what I'm wearing, just this. They wouldn't even have had this tunic. They might have had a okay, headdress. Uh, <laughs> this image here on one of the war like the two warriors. This is actually what I was just talking about before about being desk padded armor. This would, I guess, be the best example, because, one, there's only one surviving example, and it was very rare that we found one of these in ancient Egypt. However, it stated that it had this weird design, so some accounts state that the teardrop would have protected the, uh, mostly the stomach region. We don't have much evidence, but... To date most of this, we can't exactly understand. But most of this was during the Bronze Age, prior before the Bronze Age collapse. So, yeah. And that's it. Unless you were a pharaoh, you might have something like this early period. And they also had bronze armor, if you could oh, yeah. do that. Bronze armor was... Yeah, he actually has this right. Bronze-style uh, 
scale armor was very rare and mostly used by the nobles or the pharaohs. And this stuff was actually extremely light. Now, I myself have already gotten myself a Roman style scale armor. I am currently working on the variation of scale armor that would have been used uh, pretty much throughout history, but it's mostly made out of steel instead of bronze, sadly. I know that's kind of cheating, but mm, what can you do? But uh, yeah, I am still going to be working on uh, making Thing Thran's uh, scale plated uh, coif. And these were rare to say the least. In fact, these lasted from the 3rd century crisis up until like the 13th or 14th century. And they varied from region to region, but were mostly used in areas that were seen in the Middle East and quickly spread towards the West, but then degraded back towards the East. So we could understand why. But, uh, yeah. Uh, trying to make it is not going to be easy, so yeah, it might take a while, Thran, so uh, I still got to wait on the parts, so yeah. Very expensive. You could have scale armor and later century even lamellar. So we're going to test this out. This will be completely... Or lamellar de scalar. We won't be using which this today. Which was a weird armor. But uh, they would have some head protection and coverings, and that's why this axe was created second millennium B.C. in the Holy Land. By the Canaanites is who we believe created it originally, and it spread all throughout the Middle Bronze Age and on because it was the first socketed axe, and that's the precursor of the Iron Age axe and what you see all the way up till now, a socketed axe. It was known as a duck bill because of the ridge in the middle, the shape of the axe, which we believe is for armor piercing historically, and I believe we're going to prove that today, we're going to test that out. Yep. And it was able to pierce armors, it was able to pierce helmets made of bronze or leather, bone, uh, rawhide, what have you. People started wearing stuff like that. And that's when this axe became predominant. And even the Egyptians used this axe and with their bigger broad-bladed axes that they had to lace on to this better design where it's actually socketed. And it's put on this handle. And this handle that I've got here, if you see how this is shaped, it allows you to break it over and allows it to go in like when I use and I believe the reason the handles made this way is to get that around shields there's a lot of shield combat that the Egyptians were doing and this would allow you to get around the shield this the shape this would allow you to do things you couldn't normally do and get that point in where you needed it and actually that, that is actually very much true actually uh, I want to put this out here the way he's showing it that is actually accurate to how many of these axes were because the design variation on Egyptian style weapons were very weird looking compared to our modern day Pearson, but if we understand it, most of them actually were like that to get around the shield, or as well to penetrate armor. Now, there are some variations of duckbill axes I have seen that actually have a needle-like design, like somebody took it like a dagger and put it on there, like of what we can understand from, like, this style of blade like this, and it's put on the duckbill. So, why would they do that? Kind of obvious. They wanted to penetrate the armor. Now, many people don't understand this, but the fact is, if that thing got into the person, it would not end well. So, yeah. For our Egyptian warrior that we're going against today, our enemy warrior from the other side, or whoever they're fighting against today, he's going to Probably have for an of the pharaoh. So just having a couple of layers of cloth, like I do, two or three layers, which would help you maybe stop a cut from the neck or something. It's not impossible for yeah, a slice. Pretty much. He's got multiple layers of padding, because they did have linen armor. It was very much like linothorax, like you would know that the Greeks wore. And uh, there's a debate. Did they actually harden it? Was it a bunch of layers of cloth? I'm willing to believe it was a bunch of layers of cloth, because 30 layers of cloth, and I'm talking about linen cloth, whether it's uh, quilted, whether it's knotted together, with, you know, like yeah, they don't kind of like it's riveted together, however you want to do it, just loose on you like that, but, you know, to keep it from bulking, that's why they actually do the quilting. I'm willing to tell you that I think it would stop it anyway, and I don't think it necessarily has to be hardened with glue, although, that, I mean, that's another method, but once it splits, it splits the other way. It's a textile. It's much more easy to repair, and it's very protective. But today, what we've got is this is multiple layers of cloth and padding. So it probably wouldn't be black out in the desert, uh, unless you want to imagine this is his hairdo and he's got that thick of hair. I was thinking that. But uh, no, this is the same kind of thing I'm wearing, but this is a protective covering. 
And we, of course, we don't have bone. It could have bone laced on it or some kind of uh, pieces of wood, anything, if somebody was trying to protect their head at that time period. And they were trying to get more and more innovative and protective and started wearing actual helmets and scale helmets and lamellar helmets and all different kinds of things towards the end of the period. So what we're saying, it could be a bronze helmet later in end of the Bronze Age. But we're going to try this today because this is what caused the duckbill axe to be created and it be made stronger with the socket and actually be made to pierce, to pierce stuff that you might run into the field that the big broad axes and sharp edges might turn it. I might knock him silly, but this might turn an edge. This is a lot of cloth, a lot of padding. It wouldn't actually slice into his head unless you cracked his skull through it. But anyway, I've got a spear here because this could be this spear here could actually be my shield. It's not a shield, it's a spear. But it gives me something to pretend I have a shield I have to work around, but it allows you to see what's going on. And this axe with this handle, I love the way it feels. It feels awesome. Of course, you probably wouldn't be wielding it that way from behind a shield. You wouldn't be going nuts with it. Just, But it's so light, it feels awesome. We're going to come in and we're going to try to go through the skull in the most advantageous way where we can go through that. Oh! <laughs> Let's see what we got. That was just a light hit. Uh, I think it sliced through everything. Oh, no. And into the skull, but it didn't go through the skull. So I'm going to have to put more force. We'll look at that in a second. I don't see blood leaking out in you. So I'm thinking it went through. That went through all the layers of cloth. It literally sliced it. Oh! So we'll go ahead and give it another shot. Oh! Ooh, I glanced. Ooh. I glanced on that one. Oh. But it goes to show you what the head protection could do. That could have saved the man right there. We actually got a hit that didn't pierce. It would have really hurt him, but he'd have still been in the field against you. Let's go again here. Oh, oh, I glanced oh. again. This head protection is actually doing its job. Let's see what it did earlier and then we'll put it back on. But we were able to okay, yeah, I want to put this out here, y'all. When it comes down to head protection, this would have protected the opponent. But the problem is, there also is a like, chance it could have probably uh, given him blunt force trauma to the skull. So in other words, this padded armor, it may have been perfect. But the problem is, there is accounts that even if the blow didn't strike your head, for example, you could still actually get what they call hemorrhage to the brain. So in other words, you're dying very, very slowly. And it's not pretty. I have actually received one or two impacts to the skull when I was a reenactor when I was young. And because of that, I had to give up reenacting because one, the blow to my skull actually still leaves me with a headache right behind my left eyeball. Lucky for me, I was wearing a helmet, but the problem is the a uh, person I was helping train for reenactment purpose, he was using a real working mace when we were supposed to use stage uh, or reenactment approved weapons. And the problem is he wasn't using it. In fact, we even checked him. He actually actually had a uh, non-blunt... Because one, you're, you're actually also supposed to have blunted daggers or blunted weaponry here or there. Here's the thing. He had a real working... Uh, knife, something like, that has a blade like this, which is very dangerous. Now, this is just an example, it's not this design, but you see my point. You gotta be careful when it comes to reenactment, you have to make sure there are blunted weapons, not of a edge-like blade, because that is very dangerous, because this, this is very dangerous. This tip is very dangerous. Just because a blade is blunted doesn't mean it's reenactments approved so don't go if any if there are any uh people that want to get into reenacting here's the thing look up what we have to use don't just automatically buy this certain equipment in fact civil war reenactors we also had to be careful because the blunted bayonets we actually most of the time actually had to remove because it was very dangerous and as well it was also dangerous even with the swords which is why we didn't use them more than half the time so uh yeah. So any future reenactors out there, please, please for the love of God, look up what you're supposed to use first. Don't just randomly type up what you're going to end up wanting to need for historical accuracy purposes. Look up what we need for reenactment purposes.
So, yeah. We'll go completely through. And we hit the skull. We went, we went completely through and we hit the skull, but there's no blood or anything, so we won't put it back on. But it's glance two hits. That doesn't say anything bad about this axe. That says a lot about what cloth head protection can do. All right. As long as the cloth head protection here. works. Everything's still going, right, Kenny? Yeah. I might try coming in at a slight angle. Oh. Did I even hit with the point? Oh. I think oh, you hit with the... It, it did not hit with the point. That is weird. I thought I hit with the point. Oh! oh. that? Is what we wanted. But right in the forehead. How much cloth? We're talking about just a couple of layers of gambeson theoretically, but padded gambeson, not even multiple layers of cloth. This could have been 20, 30 layers of linen, tightly woven, made specifically for battle, to protect the two men in battle that his family made for him. You know, I guess the ladies would work for days to do it, or and nights, and who knows how long you think it would take that long to make enough to cover your head in 20, 30 layers. That would depend on... And then make it into a garment. Make it into something you could put on like we did. All right, but this is in there. Check this out. This is in the skull. We got a... Uh, you just turn... Thran, you just turn that guy's brain in half. You just cut it in half with that duck bill. Because one... If that thing had a brain... I, I, I'm assuming he probably put a coconut in that, I think. I don't know. Uh, but still. There's no way that guy's going to get back up after that. Because that's like about um, good two, three inch blade, a point that goes into your skull. There's probably the high possible chance he's brain dead already and dropped to the ground. Here. We'll go ahead and move this this way. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and remove this. I'll put the spear over here. It took just the right hit though, didn't it, to cause this? A few of those times I may have over hit. I may have hit too far back, but... That's not what it felt like. It felt like the axe hit, and it just didn't make it. So we'll see. We got a hole clean through here. We have a hole clean through here. Those are two hits we made it through. These slices were no, were not in there. It was fresh, and it's just two layers of the stuff. This isn't the highest grade stuff you could use for this. It's good, but it's not the best. Oh. We got our holes here. This was our first one. Oh, it went through. It went through, just not that deep. It cracked the skull. It didn't go into the brain. So the first one cracked the skull, correct, Hetty? Mm hmm That's a crack in the skull, our first one. And it pushed the cloth in, spreading the flesh out. So it cut the cloth, but it also pushed cloth in, yeah, spreading this guy's the flesh. Yeah, dead. And that's not through. This one, this one's through, correct? That is into the skull. We've got a hole into the head. Yeah, they've got this one directly into the skull, and uh, this man would be dead. There is okay, I want to put this out here. Most deaths in the Bronze Age were either caused, or in Hellenistic style warfare and such, what it was mostly caused by from deaths is mostly that to areas that of which were, say, the limbs, mostly, say, like, for example, my legs were exposed. Because what? Their person's going to go over there mostly. However, if my head was exposed, there would be an automatic hit. Because anywhere the shield wasn't covering and such, or you weren't able to get the shield to cover you, that's pretty much where you would end up having to see it. So, uh, in fact, mostly from archaeological uh, discoveries in ancient Egypt, some uh, historical skulls that were discovered, some of their heads were bashed open from certain weapons. And some actually had a small like blade uh, projection, which was about this big into someone's skull. So, my best bet, it might have been this axe. We don't have much evidence to state it might have been, because it could not have actually been a dagger, because... One, daggers weren't exactly that, uh, because one, a person isn't that strong enough to forcibly force it into someone's skull like that, especially during that point in time period. Now, there are accounts that, one, you can do it today and all that, but, uh, yeah, from most accounts, though, especially in warfare, you don't want to expose yourself by using a dagger. In fact, the only way you could pretty much do that with a dagger, especially, and daggers were... Most of the, in fact, daggers were pretty much like this, a short sword, which most people have mistaken these for daggers. These are actually a short sword. So, yeah, I'm, I keep calling them a dagger, but yeah. The only way to get a short sword like this into someone's skull for a good distance, like like for a good form like that, 
would not be like the traditional form for warfare, like a thrust like this. It would actually be mostly a downward blow like this. So, uh, this kind of says something. So, the fact is, this these warriors might have died mostly by the axe rather than the sword. This one, that was a kill. And that was through our armor. So, I believe we proved a point that the protective head covering was plausible, made out of multiple layers of cloth, like a little thorax or something. And that's not hardened or any hardened material added to it, like let's say uh, using some uh, rawhide that could be shaped and fitted under it or over it or scales, or lamellar made out of it, or something that a poor warrior could afford. Not a, not a pharaoh. A pharaoh would actually have something much better. But still, the axe did what it was supposed to do. I got the blood dripping off the axe. So, at this point, I would say we've figured out what kind of protective uh, quality that that head protection had, and that's amazing. I mean, more than I would expect. I did not expect that. This axe is not dull in any respect. It's still... Razor sharp. Oh yeah. And it. it uh oh. So yeah. Uh, Thorin, you might want to check your Let's mics. And see what it does without. I would say without the uh, protective uh, top. Let's just hit a jaw here or something. Oh. Wow. <laughs> We've cut clean through the jaw. Oh. Okay, let's look at that. But it split the jaw and cut oh. clean through it. So, and that went all the way in and turned our heads. So. This man would have a jaw cleft through. Uh, I don't know if you'd be dead, but you probably wouldn't want to be. Uh, he'd probably have a dislocated jaw. jaw. Like back then and slice through with a, uh, an axe. So the axe does have good slicing ability. Let's come over on an off angle. Oh. Oh. I hit way too far down there. I just sliced into the head. That's not what I want. Let's try again here. Right in. Oh. Took out the we got that V cut in the same Oh area. no! <laughs> so yeah, that didn't prove a lot because we already had some uh, damage to the skull itself, but that still went through. Let's try something oh, else. Man, we'll just... uh, maybe come in from the side. Oh man! Oh, it glanced Ugh. off. That is crazy. I know I had the angle right on. Let's try again. Oh! Too low, too low. We went right under the skull. Oh, another one straight into the skull. You have to have it lined up just right for it to pierce. But we got another one straight into the skull. Correct, Teddy? Yep. Did you want to examine any of this, like the jaw cut? A few. They might want to look at it. But some of these, like this one, went right under the skull. And that is a deep piercing, but that is a not how the skull. Oh man, small. his his mics are messing up this time. Got this cut directly in here, so it went straight into the side of the skull. Oh no! And this is our jaw cut here. We got a piece of it shattered and cut, but it's actually a cut into the jaw. You can see that's a cut. Not just a you can see the blood oozing out now. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I say we do a little. Always bit more wear your helmet, kids. So we don't want to waste the head. We're just doing the Canaanite axe today. Uh, where do you think I should hit it, Caddy? I think the skull is pretty much gone. We pretty much destroyed the skull. I could try a deep decapitation. Gap I, I bet you it will take the. Uh, I'm betting it will take the head off. What do you think? Exactly. It's not going to be pretty, but it might do it. Oh, wow! Did we hit the spine? Well, we definitely got. I hit the spine, but behind the spine. So yeah, it's leaking out. Look at this. I don't think we shattered. Did we shatter the spine? No. Uh, I want to put this out here. This style of axe is not meant for decapitations. It's actually meant for penetration power. In other words, while most axes that we think about, oh, they're meant to cut off limbs and all that. Well, you'd be right, but axes, the only type of axes that could do that is something like that with a wide blade design like this. Now, even an axe like this, it could also do a cut off limbs or as well even something like my head but when it comes to weapons like that of which are like this like the duckbill axe 
they're not used like that. They're actually more meant for something of penetration power. Something more along the lines like something like this, like my war hammer, or my pole hammer, I keep on mistaking those, uh, but yeah. Uh, now this is meant for penetration, it is not meant for uh, severing. For example, if I got struck in the neck, for example, with this thing, the only thing it's going to do is pretty much break my neck, the same as this duckbill axe. Now, in doing so, this weapon is very dangerous, the same as this. So, in variation and form, there are different other axes by the time of the medieval period that also have a projected blade, but were not meant for uh, the type of blows as we think of with an axe. For example, here is my Crusader Axe. Now, as you see with this type of design, this is a good example of the two type of blades. Imagine this as an Egyptian-style broad blade axe, and this as the duckbill axe. Now, many people automatically say, Oh, but Templar, this is the medieval period. Well, yeah, but this is that's a point of proving my point on an example. So, what do I mean by this? Kind of obvious. This would be the duckbill axe, of which... One, it would not be used to cut off my head, it would be meant to penetrate through my neck, which is what this style of axe was meant for. So, yeah, uh, many people don't understand that, so yeah. While the broad blade axe like this, this would be more meant to cut off someone's head, or cut off their limbs. While this would be meant to penetrate through armor, such as that, uh, leather style scale armor, or as well the scale armor I'm going to hopefully get him sent to him pretty much soon. So hopefully it will arrive, I, hopefully the parts will arrive, that way I can get it done this month and hopefully get it out by October, because one, I would like to see him test out the Bronze Age weapons against steel. Now I do have to put this out here, I don't know what difference it would have been, because one, there are accounts that do state that Bronze would be slightly harder to penetrate than steel, but it depends on their variation and form. So, yeah. Uh, let's get back into that. But the blood from the from the top is leaking out of the side. Did you want to show? It went straight through to the spine and slightly glanced off and went behind it. It's hard for me to guess where it is. Remember, this is not a broad axe. It's like fighting with a pig. It does feel like it's not as stable as it was, so... They definitely did something. Can not decapitations ahead. with these Let's weapons. Try again here. More like penetration power. Oh, that hit the spine. <laughs> well, you now, broke course, his neck. This wouldn't have taken the man's head off like this. This would have went into the side of the neck, towards the back, because that's what it would have been on a on a regular human, not quite as far forward, and it would have just slice through the vertebrae. It would destroy the vertebrae it been stuck in the neck and you would have had flesh and, and the stuff around it so it wouldn't just fall off like this. He just sliced the but neck but do not anything one, else. It pretty much, that's what it does. It's, it's, we've cut all the way through the neck, went through the spine and right, check it out Katie. So what we did is we just targeted the spine with this duckbill and took it out. The axe is still extremely sharp, and it's doing its job. But that is nice. Yeah, it's not hurting this duck bill at all. I like, I like it. It feels great. It moves well. My <laughs> hand is bloody now, and I can still use it because of the shape of the handle. It's not going to fly to me, man. Uh, we can probably go down lower and try to hit the spine again, maybe. Just for fun. Should I come in this way this time? <laughs> oh! And oh. We we did it! I went straight through the lower part of the spine, you can see it, right? Whoa! And we did it! Look, it was, it was lower than what it was, correct? We chopped it off. That was amazing. But this is not going to make big, nice slices. This is a piercing weapon, so we're getting a totally different effect here. It's going through and hitting the spine, because... Just as I said, this is a piercing weapon! <laughs> I'm aiming for the spine through the neck. It's like you knew I was going to say it before. The neck has no shoulders, so once we go completely through, yeah, and that piece is in here. Check it out. The piece that you know I cut off yeah. is right here. <laughs> so, anybody questions it, you can come look at a cat if you want. This is pretty much the end of a Our head, we can't do any more with it.
Oh. I'm impressed with it. It's a very. I, I think that I'm used to using a broader axe and was aiming a little wrong at the uh, head covering, but that would have happened back then too in the heat of battle. You would have had the same situation. Oh, yeah. The piece it. Yeah, this is it right here. This was up in here. And that's the piece from here. Correct, Kenny. Let's see, jigsaw, yeah. I believe this is it. I mean, it was in there that way, so I don't know unless I got it backwards. Dies this way. But it took it out, and oh. then the head got decapped again, and these are the holes in the neck. They're only the size of the duck bill. Check it out. Went straight in and hit our spine. Our spine would probably be a little bit farther back in a regular head, but that's just the way these heads are made. This was the one that decapped it the first time. It went straight through, and you can see the bone in here where it chopped through it. Oh. So we're able to hit it. We got through our jaw, which is also amazing, and then the head is just, you could tell, that's just nasty. First hit that we made it through with, I didn't throw a very hard shot because I didn't think it would need it. It gave him a concussion and cracked his skull. The other ones didn't do much to him, so I've given him really bad hematomas, maybe knocked him silly. But that last one, it, it went through his skull. Without that on, I have no doubt. Hey, Caddy, most of the time I have no doubt that duck bill would have killed him as long as you got a dead on hit. Yeah. without the actual padding. The padding actually did quite a bit. So I'm amazed. This is a great video. I'm impressed with the duckbill axe. It did way more than what I expected it to do. And yeah, he's not going to set up here for us now. They'll just set him here like that. There we go. Well, wasn't that a little bit fascinating to actually see you throw Andy through all that? Now, I want to make sure you all to actually inform you all to please help out things Rand as much as you all can. He is about to lose his house. So, please... Like, share, and subscribe, and as well, I will leave links down below for where you can help out Thing Thran on helping him out on Spotify, so that way y'all can actually help him out, because otherwise he might have to get rid of his collection, and that's something uh, a Texan should never do, and probably a warrior should never actually do in the first place. So, yeah. <laughs> now, I want to put this out here, y'all. Uh, when it comes down to these weapons, the weapon of the duckbill is mostly meant for that of penetration power. Now, it's not like a slicing style, it's more of a penetration style, like you would be doing with a spike end on a battle axe from the medieval period. So, yeah, these things are very horrifying, but, so, yeah. But, yeah. Like, comment, and share, and subscribe, and as well, also check out Things Ran as much as y'all can. As well, like and share his video, and as well, help him out as much as y'all can. Because, one, we are really close of helping him out, and helping him get himself and his family a better life. Otherwise, we could accidentally see the end of Things Ran in general. And, one, I have actually seen that happen before with you two being a moronic ass! Don't believe me? Here's the thing, I will leave links to explain my point. Uh, but yeah. Also, uh, Thran, this is actually a personal message. When you start to see the sea part over down there in Corpus Christi, I suggest you not cross the ocean. <laughs> uh, anyways, guys, like and subscribe. Hopefully see you on the next one. And have a great day, y'all.